These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. Uh, there's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos.htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. In these videos, uh, I'm going to be referring to some handouts and other documents that I've prepared uh, that summarize some of the material that we'll be talking about uh, in the videos. Um, and uh, I'm going to probably uh, be referring to those handouts quite a bit. Uh, you'll be able to follow along with the videos much better if you actually print those documents out and have them in front of you while you're watching the videos. You can obtain the handouts and other documents, again, at my website. Uh, again, here is the address of my website, and the easiest way to get there is just to click the link in the info box. So uh, let's go through what would happen in this reaction, for example. So we can uh, copy this into our notes, and then we can uh, go through it together. All right, so uh, the first step here is to decide uh, what type of um, reaction we're going to be having. Well, in order to have SN1, SN2, E1, or E2, you would have to have a good leaving group somewhere. Uh, so do we see any good leaving groups here? The yeah, the iodine. Uh, this is a neutral iodine, and that's a good leaving group. Uh, did I give you guys the handouts for SN2 before? Yeah. No? no? Yes? I didn't, I, it's my other notebook, so I, don't, I didn't bring it up. Okay, so that would be useful for us to refer to today, so let me give you another copy for that. Okay, here you go. Right, and we'll probably keep referring to this in the future, so this will be a good thing to keep bringing to the sessions. So let's take a look at page two of the handout, uh, the bottom of page two. So if we look at the bottom of page two, uh, you can see in the bottom right, <coughs> Uh, there's a description of what are the good leaving groups uh, in the bottom right. So if we look at the bottom right for the good leaving groups, we can see that neutral halogens are good leaving groups, which it looks like you guys already know. So here's the neutral halogens in green as good leaving groups. That means they can do SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. All right, so so far so good. But which of those reactions are we going to have in this case? How do we know this is going to be an E2 reaction? Do you guys know how we would know? Of course, I told you it would be, but how would you know? if you weren't told ahead of time that this would be E2 and not SN2 or SN1 or something like that? Well, there's a strong base. Yeah, it's not... Yeah, the base is going to be what's attacking, so not the nuclear part. Right. Now, the problem is... So, the ba um, what's the basic atom here? The basic atom is the negative oxygen. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is that a negative oxygen could be a nucleophile or a base. A basic oxygen can be a nucleophile or a base. Now, you guys are right that this will be E2, but we have to talk in more detail about uh, how we know that um, over here. Um, well, and I don't remember, uh, it's been a while since we met, I don't remember whether we talked about the big obstacles to SN2. Um, so the big obstacle to an SN2 reaction is steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. I, uh, that's actually one of the most important ideas to have in your notes. The big obstacle to an SN2 reaction is steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. By the way, it's not good enough to say steric hindrance. We should specifically say steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. Uh, if you keep that in mind, that really explains a lot of the properties of SN2. The big obstacle to SN2 is steric hindrance uh, that blocks the nucleophile. But the, the elimination reactions are unaffected by uh, sterics because they have the tetrahedral formation, right? It turns out that the uh, E2 reaction um, does not have steric hindrance as a big obstacle. That's right. Um, now, the reasoning that you were discussing there isn't quite the exact reason why the steric hindrance doesn't matter. Maybe later we'll talk about why it doesn't matter. But for now, we'll just say that steric hindrance is not a big obstacle to an E2 uh, uh, reaction. Uh, in fact, there is, um, we're not going to, uh, yeah, so we're not really going to learn a big obstacle to E2 reaction. So the steric hindrance is not a big obstacle to E2. Now, where could the steric hindrance come from? Well, steric hindrance could come from the substrate or from the base or from the solid. Um, well, in this case, uh, and the substrate is just the atom with the is just the molecule with the leaving group. I'm going to probably use that term a lot. The substrate is the thing that gets attacked. It's the molecule with the leaving group. Well, there isn't much steric hindrance here um, on uh, this substrate because this is just primary. Um, however, does this base have a lot of steric hindrance? Yes. 
Yeah, notice that this is really three methyl groups here. It looks pretty small, but it's in condensed notation. There's really three methyl groups here. So this is actually a big, what's called a bulky base. Wait, I have one question. The, um, the substrate, why is it primary? Yeah, let's go through that. So um, first of all, let's identify the alpha carbon. Again, I don't remember if we talked about that before, but the alpha carbon is the carbon with the leaving group. It's always a good idea, very good habit, to put in an alpha to mark the carbon with the leaving group. So the alpha carbon is the carbon with the leaving group. And then you want to count how many carbon chains this is attached to. If this was attached to zero carbon chains, it would be called methyl. If the alpha carbon is attached to one carbon chain, it would be called primary. If it's attached, whoops. If it's attached to two carbon chains, it's called secondary. If it's attached to three carbon chains, it's called tertiary. And if it's attached to four carbon chains, it have a group, right? it's called quaternary. So that's true. Actually, an alpha carbon could never be quaternary. However, for future reference, sometimes you will see other carbons that are quaternary. So you might as well have that in your notes. Okay. So um, you guys have learned about primary, secondary, and tertiary before, but you didn't really use it for solving problems. So this is a good time to review this because we're going to need these concepts for solving problems. So, um, so what we care about is the alpha carbon, um, and we want to know whether it's methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary. Um, you can see why if there's zero carbons attached, it would be called methyl, um, because a carbon by itself is a meth carbon. Okay, um, so you might not have heard this term methyl before, but you've seen primary, secondary, and tertiary. Well, here's our alpha carbon. How many carbon chains is this attached to? One. One. So that's why we said this is a primary alpha carbon, which is not much stereokindrons. You'd get a lot more stereokindrons if you were down here with the secondaries or tertiaries, say. So there's not too much stereokindrons uh, in the substrate. Yeah. Are you only concerned about the stereokindrons around the alpha carbon? Like, would it matter if the carbon that it's attached to is attached to another carbon chain? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, remember that what was the big obstacle to SN2? Not just steric hindrance, steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. Steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile from doing what? Steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile from attacking the alpha carbon. So all we really care about is steric hindrance that's pretty close to the alpha carbon. Now, if we put in one more carbon, that would actually be close enough that sometimes it would get in the way. So that probably would slow down the SN2 somewhat. Even though this is still primary, that would slow us down some. But then if we put on another, uh, another carbon, that would have very little effect. And a carbon after that would have approximately zero effect. Those are pretty subtle points. I think that actually was covered in uh, one of the homework problems. But um, for most of the exam problems, it'll be good enough just to figure out which of these categories you're in. It doesn't, so for the most part, it doesn't matter how long the carbon chain is. It doesn't matter how long the carbon chains are, it just matters how many carbon chains there are attached to the alpha carbon. Okay. okay, so we'll go back to our simpler case over here. All right, so again, we were saying there's not too much steric hindrance in this substrate. However, you could also have steric hindrance um, around the attacker. Well, again, this attacker has a lot of steric hindrance, so much steric hindrance that it actually would be hard for this to be a nucleophile. We said that an O with a negative charge could be a nucleophile, but not with this much steric hindrance. This is going to get in the way, and it's going to block it from attacking this alpha carbon over here. So um, we generally would not expect um, this to give us a uh, SN2 reaction. And as you guys were saying, uh, we're going to expect this to have a E2 reaction. So you have to watch out for steric hindrance from a secondary or tertiary substrate, and you also have to watch out for steric hindrance from a bulk a bulky attacker, what's called a bulky base. So it, for E2, it doesn't matter if the bulky, if the base is bulky? That's right, okay. because remember, is steric hindrance a big obstacle to E2? Yeah. Yeah. No, steric hindrance is only a big obstacle for SN2. Steric hindrance is not a big obstacle to E2. Um, so if you can't, uh, so if you have something that's bulky, it's not going to be a good nucleophile, but it can still be a, a base. Okay, so these are important ideas uh, that we're clarifying here. Okay, um, so that would give us this. Uh, 